good afternoon. I'm Jerry Carboni, and on behalf of the Bradbury Literary Festival, I welcome you to uh, uh, Andrew Nagorski's uh, reading and uh, presentation on Hitlerland. Um, this year's festival is presented by Building a Better Brattleboro and is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, the Whole Lot Foundation, Marlboro College, Vermont Arts Council, Vermont Humanities Council, and Vermont Public Radio. The festival is run entirely by volunteers, as you've heard a number of times this, today, and uh, we have real expenses, and as you know, we're, the federal government is under uh, shutdown right now, and I know that we have some... some uh, funds coming from the National Endowment on Humanity, so they may not be for a while, but uh, if you care to make a donation, we have a box at the uh, entrance as well as an envelope that you can uh, send in a very large check. <laughs> there is no, sorry? The envelopes are next to the uh, donation box. Uh, there's no photography or recording without express permission of the festival. We are recording this, uh, BCTV is recording this for a later broadcast and it will be uh, available on demand from their website. So you can actually uh, send a link to a friend if you want, and they can, they can watch it once it comes up. Uh, at the end of the uh, program or sometime over the weekend, please fill out one of our feedback forms. It helps that we read every one of them, and it helps us uh, plan next year's uh, festival. And um, just remember, uh, take this thing out of your pocket and turn off the ringer, because last in the last session, I forgot to mention, and sure enough, the cell phone went off. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Andrew Nagorski. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, who spent more than three decades as a foreign correspondent editor for, for Newsweek, is vice president and director of public policy for the East-West Institute, an international affairs think tank with offices in New York, Brussels, and Moscow. As senior editor for Newsweek International, he launched four foreign language editions, an Arabic version, and magazines in Poland, Russia, and Argentina. He has served as Newsweek's bureau chief in Berlin, Warsaw, Bonn, and Rome. He also had two tours uh, as Moscow's chief, earning him international notoriety when, in 1982, the Soviet government, angry about his enterprising reporting, expelled him from the country. He has been honored three times by the Overseas Press Club for his reporting, and in, in November 2009, Poland's foreign minister Radislaw Sikorski presented him with the newly created Bene Merito Award for his reporting from Poland. And again in 2011, he was awarded the Calvary Cross Medal by Poland's president. Besides Hitlerland, he has written four books, Reluctant Farewell, An American Porter's Candid Look Inside the Soviet Union, The Birth of Freedom, Shaping Lives and Societies in the New Eastern Europe, The Greatest Battle, Stalin, Hitler, and the desperate struggle for Moscow that changed the course of World War II, and a novel, The Last Stop Vienna, made it to the Washington Post bestsellers list. Hitler, Hitlerland, American eyewitness to the Nazi rise to power, chronicles Germany's march to the abyss as seen through the eyes of Americans, diplomats, military expatriates, visiting authors, and Olympic athletes. The book covers various personalities that you'll be familiar with, Howard K. Smith, Dorothy Thompson, George Kennan, Charles Lindbergh, Jesse Owens, Edward R. Murrow, Sinclair Lewis, and Richard Helms. There's also a uh, focus on Ambassador William Dodd, whose playgirl daughter, Martha, slept with handsome Nazis, and when she tired of them, slept with handsome Soviets. As a librarian, I recommend this book to anyone and everyone. The backstories are incredible. Hitler's attempted suicide after the Beer Hall Pusch, stopped only by an American wife of the Harvard-educated German friend, Ernst Hoffensteinl. The account by an American journalist whose audience with Hitler took place in the Fuhrer's office with a life-size portrait of Henry Ford looking down on him. And the most surprising story of, of all to me is the one told about Donald Watt, our own Donald Watt, the founder of the Ex Brattle Brattleboro's Experiment in International Living, who was in Berlin during his time, and I won't go any further. <laughs> You'll have to read the book to find out about that. <laughs> the book is cinematic. The film and TV rights have been optioned. Please welcome Andrew Nagorski. Jerry, thanks so much for that welcome. Uh, you know, I think you said you, you gave away all the good lines. So. <laughs> and also, it was interesting, I, I, I'm always curious why certain authors show up at, at certain venues. 
and I was at the previous uh, uh, event here with Tom Kizia, and, he, and now I know. He went to Hampshire College, I went to Amherst, so I think this is only for authors who went in Connecticut Valley Colleges, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it's good to be in this part of the country again. Uh, always look back at that era of my life in, with you know, remembering this part of the country very well. Uh, and uh, in this rather bucolic setting, I'll talk about a somewhat less than bucolic era in a less than bucolic country. Uh, first of all, why this title? Why this era? The title Hitlerland, I know some people cringe a bit, uh, but I, and it wasn't the title going into this project at all, but one of the many things I discovered early on was that in the 1930s, American journalists stationed in Berlin began referring to the country they were covering, among themselves, of course, not in print, as Hitlerland, mm. because it was so dominated by this one man, and the cult of this one man was so extreme. So it, it was a name that stuck. Uh, now, I, when I was at Amherst, I studied history. I went on to be a journalist, as Jerry mentioned, a reporter. And so I, I was lucky enough to see a lot of history in the making, particularly on the other side of, of, of the East-West Divide in, in Russia, in Poland, Czechoslovakia, other countries. And, uh, I, was so pre and I was based in Germany twice, uh, but, and, but I was so preoccupied with those, that stories of the moment while I always avidly read histories of that era, I never really paused to think, what would it have been like to have tried to cover that era if I had been a correspondent in Berlin instead of in the 90s or in the 80s as I was in Bonn, uh, in, in, the, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and a few years ago, there were some books that came out about Americans in Paris, Americans in London, and that triggered the thought, well, really, what was that American experience like in Germany and, I, and as I began to explore that and began to look for materials, and, and first of all, interviewing a few people who are still alive, uh, one person who's, who's, whose name you, some of you may recognize, Richard Hodlett, who was, who was one of the original Morrow, Morrow Boys later on uh, with NBC, uh, and, and a couple more people like that, but mostly get often talking to their kids, discovering, <coughs> Uh, looking at, at their published and unpublished memoirs, their correspondence uh, tucked away in various, various places, I, I realized that there is an angle here on this era that as much as one may have read things like the, William Shiver's brilliant book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, but it, that's history in retrospect. And what, if, what I try to do in this book is put you in the shoes of the Americans at the time who happened to be there. Uh, most of them were journalists and diplomats, but there were others as well, very, very famous writers, people like Thomas Wolfe, Sinclair Lewis, others. Uh, and then allow you to try to see the reader what, what was going on and, and the implicit question to myself, and I think anyone has to ask, ask themselves, is what would I have understood if I'd observed this? Because I think the assumption is, especially about this era, you look back at history and you say, well, one event had to lead to the next event and then to that horrible next event. And nowhere was this more true with, with, with the rise of Hitler. But there was, I knew from my own experiences covering, for instance, the collapse of communism, that there were all sorts of surprises and things that could have turned out differently. And the more I, I got into the, inside the minds and, and the thinking of, of, and observations of my characters, the more I began to feel that this was an era where also it, was, it was, did not seem all that clear to many people. So I went through and found these sources and began to, I, I start the book right at the end of World War I. And remember, Germany, of course, is defeated in World War I. It's lost two million men. Uh, it, there's an economic crisis that is just absolutely horrifying. People's life savings are wiped out. 
Uh, one of the most one of the most striking stories I always go back to that jumped out at me from that period. You know, many of you have heard about the classic stories about wheelbarrows full of money because there was so much. They kept printing more and more money, and the more mo money became so worthless, people were literally carting money any way they could to stores to try to buy something. And in this particular incident that that I discovered in somebody's journal, a woman brought her wheelbarrow full of money to a store, rushed inside to see if there's anything to buy for this money, and left that wheelbarrow outside, comes out on the pavement, the wheelbarrow's gone, the money's all on the pavement. <laughs> That's, you know, says something, yeah, for the, for just how desperate things were. And of course, in that atmosphere, you have extremists of the left and the right, you have communists, remember the Soviet revolution had just taken place, so you have the German communists, you have right-wing groups which are called the Fry Corps, the Free Corps, uh, and they're fighting it out on the street, and yet, this is, an, uh, Berlin particularly, is an amazingly attractive place. It's also, Germany experiments with democracy for the first time, they start the Weimar Republic, a very democratic constitution, and there is an explosion of the arts. This is a city where you begin to read the journals of Americans there at the time, and there are parties in which you run into, into uh, Albert Einstein, Bertolt Brecht, uh, you know, George Gross, Marlena Dietrich. You know, this is an amazing city, and we tend to think of Paris in the 20s as the great magnet for Americans. But in fact, Berlin was even more so. It, it was the cultural capital of the world. And it was also attractive to Americans because it was very cheap, first of all, because of this hyperinflation. If you had hard currency, which meant dollars, you could live very well on very little. So very many young, young uh, very uh, ambitious people would, would come there. Howard K. Smith, for instance, who later became an anchor, a famous TV anchor, comes over later uh, in, in, in to, to Germany right after uh, his studies because he won a short story contest which gave him a hundred bucks. He said, where can I make that hundred bucks go the furthest? It was Berlin. And that's where he ends up and, later, and starts his journalistic career there. And the other attraction of, the, of, of life in Berlin, you had the extremes, the political extremes, but you also had the social extremes. And this was a party town. This was the sexual capital of the world. The 60s, believe me, were nothing compared to what was going on in Berlin. And you had people like Josephine Baker, who was performing in Paris. She comes over in the mid-20s with her, her, her troupe of all black entertainers. And outside, there are already neo-Nazi groups or Nazi groups beginning to protest the, these black performers. Inside, Germans are loving her performances, showering her with gifts, inviting her to after parties where she performs in her loincloth and to wild applause. And she says, this is, you know, this is far more of an, of an electric place than, than Paris. Uh, so you have all of this and you have Journalist, one of, one of the most perceptive journalists of that era was a man by the name of Edgar Maurer from the Chicago Tribune, and he was there both in the 20s and the 30s. And in the mid-20s, he wrote this line about, about Germany. He said, it is hard to conceive a much more tolerant society. When you know what's coming next, of course, that's a pretty staggering statement. But it also, in some ways, was definitely true. So you have this, this thing which is because of that dark shadow about to descend on Germany, uh, we've forgotten a lot of that. And so, I, so uh, a lot in the early stages of my book, I sort of recreate that through the eyes of the American experiences. But at the same time, there are these, these movements going on, these radical movements, and there is a young rabble rouser in Munich by the name of Adolf Hitler, and who had served in World War I. And one of, one of my questions was, 
who were the first americans who ever met this guy and what did they think of him before anybody knew who he was before he was a household name and i and i discovered there were two people who met him in nineteen twenty one so really no one had heard heard of hitler yet in uh... in in uh... across the atlantic and even in germany a lot of people hadn't heard of him yet and one of them was a hearst correspondent for the hearst newspaper chain henry von vegan who was a, himself from a German immigrant family, had come to the United States when he was a little boy. He settled on a farm in I Iowa with his, with his dad, whose his dad had a lot of economic problems during the Depression. He ran away from home. He actually hung out with, he worked for Buffalo Bill for a while. And he's one of these good, bizarre stories. He ends up on the West Coast, and when World War I breaks out, is sent to Europe because he speaks German, and becomes a famous correspondent. And in 1921, what also happens is Mussolini comes to power in Italy. And there's first talk of this new movement called fascism. And von Wiegen sort of says, well, well I'm going to see if there's anybody in Germany who might try to do what Mussolini did. In other words, is there kind of a miniature Mussolini in the making? That's the way they were thinking of it, of it at the time. And he goes, and someone tells him to go to Munich. He meets Hitler. And here's what he writes about him, which is probably the first description for American readers. He calls him a magnetic speaker, having also ex exceptional organizing genius. And he says he's age 34, medium tall, wiry, slender, dark hair, cropped toothbrush mustache, eyes that seem at times to spurt fire, straight nose, finely chiseled features with a complexion so remarkably delicate that many a woman would be proud to possess it, and possessing a bearing that creates an impression of dynamic energy well under control, that is Hitler, one of the most interesting characters I have met in many months. And he goes on to say, this man has a lot of the characteristics of a leader. One day, he may become the dictator of Bavaria, which in 1921 is a pretty daring prediction. Uh, and, and there's another American, a 29-year-old junior military attache by the name uh, 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 Truman Smith, who's from Connecticut, from a very distinguished family. And he also comes down at the same time, meets Hitler, and also calls him a, a uh, uh, a, a marvelous demagogue, marvelous in the sense of a talented demagogue. I've rarely listened to such a logical and fanatical man. So, you know, what I kind of went into this assuming that I would see a lot of people misread Hitler at first and then get progressively more uh, sort of alarmed by him and more knowledgeable about him. You, you look at these two first Americans, and they're pretty, pretty good observations. But they were, which, what I soon discovered, things were far from linear. And I'll give you a few examples. First of all, there were those Americans who were fascinated with, with Hitler, some of them, including the man uh, Jerry mentioned, uh, who went by the nickname Putzi, who was Homstangle, who was what he called half American. His mother was from Boston from the Sedgwick family, a very famous family in Boston. Uh, his grandfather had been a Civil War general, uh, and his father was a Bavarian art dealer with shops in, very, in London and New York. <coughs> so very cosmopolitan. He goes to Harvard, class of 1909. Uh, we, he, among his classmates are people like T.S. Eliot uh, and, uh, and Teddy Roosevelt, Jr with whom he becomes very friendly and even gets invited to the White House. Putzi is a real character. He's very tall. He plays the piano, uh, is very popular, and is always entertaining people. And so Putzi is you know, really plugged in here. In the, after he graduates from Harvard, he runs the family store, family art gallery on Fifth Avenue in New York marries a woman by the name of Helen, whose parents had come from Germany, but she was a born and bred New Yorker. And then in 1921, they moved to, to Munich to continue with the family business there. And then they meet Hitler. 
uh, and become very close friends. And Putzi becomes Hitler's first propagandist. And he, because of his American, half American side, becomes the, the link between Hitler and many Americans who, who, are, who, who would try to contact him as he becomes more famous. And the other part of the story, which also Jerry alluded to, was uh, Hitler becomes totally fascinated with Helen, his wife, the American wife. And it's so much so that at one point, after the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, when Hitler tries to overthrow the Bavarian authorities in Munich, and it goes, goes sour when the police open fire on the Nazis, kill about 14 of them, uh, Putzi disappears, he, he flees to Austria, but Hitler is in a car that breaks down and he also has a dislocated shoulder, probably because the guy he was walking arm in arm in with uh, had yanked him to the ground when he was shot and killed. So think about that, the trajectory of that bullet for a moment, what, how history might have been different. Uh, and then he, their car breaks down and Hitler takes refuge in Helen's house with Helen for the night. Not, I'm not implying anything sexual here. The whole sexual thing with Hitler is another subject. <laughs> but they clearly had a f f fascination with Helen. He is put up, he and an aide are put up there. And the next morning, when, when Hitler gets up and, and, and Helen gets up and gets a phone call from her mother-in-law down the street saying, the police are closing in, they're coming to arrest Hitler. She goes upstairs and tells Hitler, you're about to be arrested. That's the moment where he's holding a gun where she's convinced that he's going to commit suicide and where the rest is in the book. <laughs> but you know he survives, but the, the, the thought that maybe this American woman talked him out of suicide is this, it, which she was convinced that what happened is another one of those stra sta staggering what ifs. So you had people like that, but most of the people uh, in the early, most of the Americans in the early days were simply, were simply trying to figure out who this Hitler was. And so Hitler is, has this period of popularity when there's this hyperinflation economic crisis, he thrives on it. But then for a while in the mid-20s, things are going better, by the way, with a lot of American <coughs> banking assistance. And Hitler's popularity drops, the Nazis' popularity drops, but then the Great Depression hits. And suddenly the Nazis are on their way to becoming the biggest party in the country. And here's where you'd think the Americans would say, would really realize what the danger is. But, for instance, Dorothy Thompson, the most famous American woman correspondent of that era, goes to interview Hitler at, in November 1931, only 14 months before he takes power. And she, she writes immediately afterwards, I was convinced that I was about to meet the future dictator of Germany, but when I walked in that room in something less than 50 seconds, I was quite sure I was not. It took just that long to measure the startling insignificance of this man who has set the world agog. He is formless, almost faceless, a man whose countenance is a caricature. He is a very prototype of the little man his eyes, she said, have the peculiar shine which often distinguishes geniuses, alcoholics, and hysterics. He also, she also adds, he has the soft, almost feminine charm of the Austrian. By the way, that's one of the recurring themes that in many cases the, the, the Americans feel, well, this guy's a little you know, questionable in, his, in terms of his manliness. The real manly German politicians will not allow him to get very far. And, and, she's, and so she totally dismisses him. Later on, of course, she figures things out once he's already you know, gets power and, just, and she's one of the first to warn the world that Germany has basically gone to war, uh, war already, but the rest of you haven't figured that out. But it's interesting, so many people misjudged Hitler for that kind of reason, because in a, in a, especially in a one-on-one -on -one interview, and I, 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 our, our conversation, he never made eye contact. 
He'd be sort of looking up in the, as if he was addressing a rally. He had all of these quirky motions. And there was a feeling, this guy can't be serious. And the Germans are far too cultured a people to, to elect someone to, like this to office. And then there was sort of, let's say, I'd say the wishful thinking routine. Uh, you know, and many people assumed, well, he may be saying a lot of those nasty things in Mein Kampf, but first of all, nobody had really read Mein Kampf for the most part. Uh, but if they sort of playing to his base in modern terms. You know, if he comes to power, he'll be much more moderate. And in fact, when Hitler first comes to power, some people want to believe his reassurances about we are, we're really for peace and so forth. And one of those big people, by the way, again, as Jerry mentioned, lived just up the way in Putney. And that was Donald Watt, who started the experiment in international living, a wonderful, you know, sort of idealistic venture, which continues to this day. Uh, but it, he did a, had a small group of American students he took to Europe in 1932. And in the summer of 1933, after Hitler's already in power, he determines to, decides to go to Germany with them. And he, people are saying, you really don't want to do that. You know, this, this is not a, a, na a pleasant place. So here's what he concludes from his experiences in Germany. Taking, he takes them anyway, and he says, from its warlike reputation, one would have expected Germany to have been the most in, inhospitable toward the group interested in making peace. Just the opposite materialized. The Nazi organizations made us feel most welcome. The picture which the American newspapers gave and what we actually saw in our families could scarcely have been more different. The suggestion of personal danger to foreigners is no less, less laughable to those who spent the summer in that country than the thought of German courtesy failing. And then he said, as the, the kids, the students lived in German families, they realized all that they had learned of Hitlerism in America was definitely unfavorable, but here they actually saw some, some good features of it. And even when it came to the question of Jews, he reported that everyone in his group concluded that relatively few were roughly handled. The main cause of anti-Semitism in Germany, he add, was the fact that, quote, a large proportion of all business was in Jewish hands. And then he concludes, but perhaps most important of all, we realized that the people whom we met were very much like us. The second international experiment in international living was an interesting and successful demonstration of tolerance. So, you know, you have that, you know, obviously, clearly, well-intentioned man who told, and, 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 and these young, impressionable kids told totally getting it, getting it wrong. So you have that sort of thing. But even among more critical observers, the, the failure to see the danger that Hitler represented, in some ways, you know, Americans can be said, well, were they naive? But many educated Germans made the same mistake. Uh, and... Many, and some German Jews made the same mistake. Uh, I, I came across the story of Robert Murphy, who was then a young diplomat, a, a young consul general in, in Munich in the 20s, when, when the Nazis were holding their first rallies. And he had a man by the name of Paul Dre, who was from a very distinguished Bavarian Jewish family, who was working in the American consulate with him. And they went to these, watched these uh, rallies together. And he kept telling, asking Dre, he said, you know, what do you think of this? Should we be worried by this? And Dre said, no, no, no. We're, you know, the Germans are never gonna, going to uh, uh, elevate a movement of such uneducated people to the, to the top. And that was in the 20s. Hitler comes to power in the 30s. Dre is still in Bavaria. Munich, uh, uh, Murphy has moved on to other assignments, but in about the mid 30s, he, ru he rushes back to Germany with a specific purpose of getting his friend Paul Dre out of Germany, says to him, look, you've, you've got to get out of here. This is no joke anymore. And I'm going to get you a job overseas, wherever you settle. And Dre refuses. He says, this is going to pass. He died in Dachau. So you know, there are many people who got things wrong. 
and and but but, but it's also it, a window in you watching this to me watching how people got things wrong was sometimes more interesting than the folks who got things right. Although I really admire the ones who did. There were several American journalists, diplomats who were very, very uh, prescient. Uh, for instance, again, this man Edgar Maurer of the Chicago Tribune. He would actually meet. German Jews and tell them, just as Hitler was coming to power, get out of Germany right now, and would offer them maps to the border and go to Czechoslovakia, and was writing really hard-hitting articles that basically got him driven out of, out of Germany in, in September of 1933. And there was a council general in, 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 in Berlin who was also very, very, you know, really trying to pound this message home in, in, to, to the United States. But he was often accused of being, oh, what do you want, another world war? You know, there was, in the U.S., there was, people were tired of war, war. Sound familiar? I mean, you know, there's a little bit, you know, nobody wants to hear there may be another challenge here that's, you know, you won't be able to escape it. So they often felt very isolated. And then you had just what I call the adventurers, Martha Dodd, who Jerry mentioned, of course, the, this, the, this woman who went from, you know, communist sympathizer to from, from Nazi sympathizer to communist sympathizer and ended up actually spying out for the Soviets and not only spying for the Soviets but actually offering to the Soviets to spy basically on her father, the ambassador, which is pretty stunning stuff. Uh, and then you have, I'd say, I'll let me just add one more specific kind of story that I, I didn't, you know, was not expecting to find. Uh, Truman Smith, the same military attaché who was there in the early 20s came back in the mid-30s as senior military attaché. And luckily, his wife wrote wonderful memoirs and, and, and diaries and, which were never published but were preserved. And his daughter, who lived until recently in Connecticut, she just died, preserved them, gave them to the Hoover Archives where I was able to get them. Uh, and and, and Truman Smith kept a lot of a lot of a lot of diaries about his his own more uh, his focus on the German military, but all of us, for instance, know that Charles Lindbergh came to Germany in this period and, and had pro-German leanings. But what I hadn't realized was why he came to Germany and where did this idea ever come from? And it had nothing to do whether he was pro-German or not initially. It had to do Truman Smith one day was reading the newspaper and saw that Lindbergh, who was the most famous man of that era, he had done his Atlantic crossing and, and so forth, was touring France and seeing the French Air Force and its factories. And he suddenly realized, I can't find out much about the German Air Force. I have good contacts in the German Army, but not in the Air Force. And I know they're they must be building up just as fast under Hitler. So he planted the idea with Hermann Goering, who was the head of the German Air Force, to invite Lindbergh to come to Germany. He knew that Goering was a monumentally vain man who loved to be in the presence of celebrities and thought the idea would appeal to him. And that's exactly what happens. And so Goering invites Lindbergh. Lindbergh comes and Lindbergh tours all these, the, these facilities with the newest planes. And he's allowed to bring the uh, US military attaches with him. And Lindbergh knew his planes and would brief them also on what they were seeing. So Lindbergh, while he, he en ended up being, of course, the head of the America First movement, the uh, isolationist, but he was providing really valuable intelligence at the same time, probably because he's thinking, if, I, if the Americans understand how powerful this country will, is becoming, we'll never confront it. But whatever his motives, there was real intelligence. And then there was also real comedy of the absurd. In one case, Goering invites Lindbergh and Anne Morrow Lindbergh and Truman Smith and his wife to a lunch. And it's a very elaborate lunch with lots of other people. And during the lunch, uh, it's Truman Smith, leans, uh, Lindbergh leans over to Goering and says, I hear you have a pet lion. And, and Goering says, yes, would you like to see it? And so they go in off to the library, and this lion cub jumps up into Goering's lap. Oh my God. And you know, if you made this up in a Hollywood script, you'd say, this is too absurd. 
So, and as more and more people are edging into the library to take a look at Goering with his pet lion, and remember, Goering is this big, fat guy in a white uniform, and suddenly the lion, get, the lion cub gets a little nervous, and the white uniform turns bright yellow. <laughs> and Goering rushes out of the room and, and disappears and changes and, and, and sprays eau de cologne on himself. So, yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was enough of a kind of one of these stories you saw, wow, that, you know, that, that's amazing. But then I meet Truman Smith's daughter in Connecticut. We spend a day together. She was about 12 or 13 at the time. And I, and I ask her you know, all, all about what she remembers. I go home. The next day she calls. She said, Andy, did, you by, did I by any chance show you the photo on my refrigerator? I said, no, he didn't show me a photo on my refrigerator. It's the one where I'm sitting there with Goering's lion. <laughs> and sure enough, it's the favorite photo in my book. I mean, if you later see the book. She was, her, her dad, what happened was, Goering got so upset with that lion that he gave it back to the zoo. And Truman Smith, having, having the con connections, arranged to have his daughter take a photo, have his daughter have a photo with this lion. And she said, take a look, my hand, I've got gloves on my hands. I was terrified of this animal, but my dad insisted I have this photo. <laughs> so, so amidst all of this, you know, sort of earth-shaking, you, know, uh, you know, uh, catastrophic events, there are also these, these amazingly bizarre events. Uh, and it only reinforced to me the whole notion about, yeah, there, the, how individuals and, their, and, and the, the individual stories uh, shape history in, a, in ways sometimes that we, we can't possibly imagine. And uh, the small outcomes and the big outcomes can be shaped in, in, in ways that, uh, that you know, could, it could have gone in a number of different directions. Unfortunately, it went in the direction we know. And those Americans who were there, by the way, all the way up till Pearl Harbor, even after World War II started when Germany invaded Poland, they were still there because America was not in the war. So I take it right up to Pearl Harbor, the expulsion of the internment of the last Americans who were interned in, in, in fairly good conditions in an abandoned hotel spa, uh, while, by the way, the German diplomats and journalists were, were interned in, in, if any of you know, the place called the Greenbrier in West Virginia, which is one, as close to a luxury spa as possible, that's where they spent their internment. On that uh, note, I think I'll stop and uh, happy to take a, take a few questions. Thank you. So it's true, you, you really pointed out how amazing it is what history can tell us if we're willing to look at it. Uh, if you were to write down two or three rules of procedure for correspondence today to anticipate where uh, and what uh, trends are happening based on what you've learned in this book and your experiences, do you have any suggestions as to what you would look for going forward? That's a tough question, and, yeah, uh, and it's a good one. Uh, uh, the question was, would I ha what would I give as advice to correspondents going forward? What would I have learned? I mean, on one level, I remember when I was in the Soviet Union and, uh, and reporting from there, and, and my editors would keep saying, well, what's, what's going to happen next? What? And, and, and what we'd say, well, we live in a, and some of us would say, well, we live in a totalitarian society where everything is under these, you know, is hidden, and even the past is rewritten. So he said, how can we predict the future when this country has an unpredictable past? Uh, but yes, uh, as a serious thing, I mean, I'd say take away two things. One is, and this is not only for journalists, I mean, the biggest mistake I think people made about Hitler and his movement, was his rhetoric was so extreme and so, so outside the rational framework that rational people tend to, to dismiss it. Because saying, he can't possibly mean what he says. So I'd say, you know, when there are radical movements, whether they are, you know, it's Nazis, whether it's Al-Qaeda and so forth, when they make really extreme pronouncements, 
it, I'd rather err on the, on the side of belie believing them than dismissing them just because I can't imagine any normal person would, would follow them. So that's one thing. The other thing is to you know, never underestimate the role of individuals in history. I saw this in a reverse way in, again, in the Cold War, watching people like Lech Wałęsa in Poland, Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia, some really courageous dissidents in the Soviet Union, how people fighting a, a, seemingly insurmountable odds. And a lot of correspondents tended to say, well, why, you know, these, these, these folks are so marginalized and they're in prison or they're, they're you know, they, they, the state is so, so uh, powerful, they, they don't have a chance, why pay so much attention to them? I think in a, in a society which is repressive, the voices of those who have the courage to, to uh, you know, to, to speak up are, are doubly, triply important to listen to and to, and to, and to respond to uh, and to try to, try to uh, report on. So that, that would be my, my other thought, you know, it, you know both individuals and, the, you know, and, who, and movements that are positive and, and negative uh, you know, just because there's a surface order to a society, don't believe necessarily what you see on the surface. Uh, yes, back there. Um, just your book reveal whether or not the average German citizen living in Germany during the time that concentration camps were operational, did they know about them? I had a friend who had grandparents that lived there at the time, and they would tell me repeatedly that average Germans, they themselves did not know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, well, first of all, uh, I should say that in this particular book, I end the book in ni early 1942 when, yeah, of course, there are already concentration camps and there. I, I actually describe visits of, of some American journalists or staged visits to camps, but that was before they had become, yeah, yeah they were only becoming full-fledged killing machines. Uh, people were dying, but you know, it, was, it wasn't as horrific as what was about to happen. But yeah, I've lived in Germany, and and uh, yeah, I think there are cases where people had a pretty good idea something was happening, but clearly did not want to know. I think was in many cases, and you know, you even had the uh, family of the commander of Auschwitz, who was who had a had a villa which was right border the camp. And the kids claimed, well, we really didn't know what was happening in the camp, even though they could sort of look right into the camp. So, you know, there's a level of denial in some cases. Uh, now, naturally, you know, the war's going on. People are concerned with their own survival, and they don't want to look left or right. And they see, see things that, you know, could, could clearly are, are, are negative signals, and, and, they, and they deliberately look away. But then there are also people who were very much, you know, an extended groups of people who had to have seen and had to be part of that system, even if they weren't directly in the camps, but who just, you know, sort of blockaded their minds and said, you know, I'm powerless to do anything about it, therefore I'm not guilty in any way. Uh, yeah, let me take one question over here first. Yeah. I seem to remember, I read your book quite a while ago when it first came out. I seem to remember something about JFK being in the Berlin at the time, and he was like an unruly college student. Yes, yes. John F. Kennedy, yes. Since we're in New England, yes. Uh, JFK came through through Germany, I think it was the summer of 37, so Hitler was already in, in, in power for four years. He was, after his freshman year at Harvard, he came with a friend of his. Uh, his diary entries are very cryptic. I think he was there four or five days. Uh, they're not, they don't reveal a lot. He says something about how much, how orderly German city towns are and so forth, which could be read as kind of sympathetic in some ways, but I wouldn't read too much about into that. It's it just sort of like you know, because of his father's, Joseph Kennedy's, pro, uh, you know, sort of uh, leanings. I, I'm not sure he shared them. But the main, he seemed most preoccupied with what he called the bundle of fun he picked up at the border, uh, and and the parties, and he's saying the innkeepers were, were rather irate with him and his his, his traveling buddy uh, because they come back after after rather raucous evenings. Uh, so his mind, I don't think, was really focused on on the politics of the place. <laughs> yes. Deal with American companies like Ford and DuPont and IBM who 
continue doing business until yeah. we're forced not to. I deal with them some, but not a lot. There have been some good books on that. And, uh, you know, there were American, a lot of American companies there in the 20s. And by the way, on Henry Ford, it's interesting, yeah, uh, as Jerry mentioned, there was that, uh, the, a Detroit reporter who came in where, uh, to interview Hitler, where he had a portrait of Henry Ford. Hitler clearly admired Ford. I'm still not sure. I mean, I think the fact that he was anti-Semitic in Hitler's view was a bonus. But he admired him for setting up for 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 the you know having a car that to, for the masses, which of course was the concept of a Volkswagen. Sure. Uh, that that was what, and uh, at one point I, you know there was, I know uh, I, I think there were attempts to get Ford to directly support the Nazis. There's never been any evidence, as far as I know, to to do it. But of course, many American companies continued to do business in Germany. There's one scene in my book where I, the American ambassador describes how just opposite his house in 1934 when there was a night of the long knives when Hitler had his first round of executions of various, various uh, people he just wanted to wipe out. Uh, the, an American banker came out of his house and found a body on his doorstep. And, he, and up till then he had been enthusiastic about continuing business in Germany he said even this banker changed his mind after that. But there were a lot of companies, IBM was certainly, there's a lot of history of that. I do, do not go into it in this great detail. Uh, in part, I, uh, to be honest, you know, I have to go with, I wanted to get a lot of personal reflections, uh, first-hand impressions, and who were the people who did that best? The people who write, write for a living, journalists, diplomats who were reporting back, uh, writers like uh, Thomas Wolfe, uh, who incidentally in, in first trip to Germany in mid 30s was also enthralled, and then by the next trip was was really horrified, and it was the basis for a novella that later became part of "You Can't Go Home Again." Yes. Well, I noticed you didn't mention uh, Janet Flanner, uh, who sent very sharp wry dispatches to the New Yorker from 28 to. Time in the 40s and uh, even the 50s, I think, and uh, very sharp observations of Hitler from Berlin. Mm -hmm. She mostly wrote from Paris, but she was also in Berlin. She was only going in and out, as far as I know. Yeah, but they were very, very, uh, very telling observations of the rise of Nazism and Hitler himself. Which I don't think she had an interview, but she certainly got close to some of them. I wondered. If you had uh, run through her? I, I, I read some of hers, and I actually quote her in regards to her description of Germany at the time, Berlin at the time of the 36 Olympics, where frankly, I think she got a little over-enthused by the show that was put on, as many Americans did. But I, I did not, I don't know her whole body of work on the subject, uh, but, it's, but it's interesting how many people, for instance, when, when in the 36 Olympics, which was in itself one of these big propaganda shows, which Hitler, incidentally, was amb ambivalent about initially about whether to hold the Olympics because they didn't like this idea of all these races and and, and folks uh, coming in. But and and it, and as you may know, in this country there was a big debate: should the U.S. participate in this Olympics or boycott it? And Avery Brundage, who was head of the International Olympic, uh, the American Olympic Committee at that time, comes in and is sort of giving a show tour. To, to reassure him that Jewish athletes can compete as well, which of course was nonsense. Uh, but at, at one, but he's shown a few token Jew Jewish athletes in gyms and so forth. And and at one point he turns to one of his Nazi handlers and says, "Oh well, in my men's club in Chicago, we don't allow Jews in either." So you know, it's you know, we tend to forget just how anti-Semitic this country was too, and how many other Western societies. So initially, there were many people, when they heard about the anti-Semitism in Germany, thinking, oh, it must be something similar. You know, it's bad, but it's, it can't be. But, and some American Jews who I, I describe in this book who came in like a labor organizer from the West Coast, at first meeting uh, German Jews, saying, well, we've got our clan, we got this, that, or the other, and then the, he describes how German Jews started telling him what was really happening. He said, you know, he suddenly began to realize this is a whole different dimension. Yes? Um, 
when you were living in Germany, did you notice any significant differences in how scholars um, worked on history and what they taught in school about history in America or, and in Germany? About this era? About this era, yeah. yeah. Like if, if the kids learn different stuff in America than they li uh, learn different stuff in America than they learn in, in Germany. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think one of the, the, the things, though, it's Germany deserves a lot, West Germany, of course, before the Cold War, not East Germany, uh, deserves a lot of credit for, is that after initial period of, of a lot of silencing and cover up, uh, they, and then went through the 60s and this sort of this questioning, that, that Germany really introduced this into its curriculum and very few countries who've had you know, horrific moments in their history have done so and really tried to have some sort of, sort of an accounting for it. The, Russia to this day has never had a full accounting of Stalinism. There have been attempts and during the perestroika period in Glasnost, but now, and, and, and there still are occasional attempts, but there's still an awful lot of, of, of false history there, or re really cover-up history. In Germany, I think it's much more much, much more deliberate. But, you know, also I've heard and sometimes in schools they complain that, well, we don't necessarily always make it through to that period, you know, you, you get caught up, you know, some teachers maybe are a little less interested in quite getting there. But, I, again, I'd say, yeah, I, and there is, of course there's a different approach and there's sometimes, you know, there's certain subjects about World War II that you cover in Germany uh, differently, for instance, and there's always always kind of a nervousness about it. Uh, for instance, the expulsion of Germans from Eastern Europe, from Poland, Czechoslovakia, the you know, when many 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 people were killed by these advancing Soviet troops and the new communist authorities in those countries expelling, there was ethnic cleansing. There's no question about it. There was a sense of vengeance, and. In Germany, there's been some some focus on that sometimes, especially there are the groups of expellees there. Uh, but there, and some people are willing to talk about that. Others are nervous as if they say anything about that. It's as if they are, you know, sort of trying to equate the two things that happened. Uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a minefield. Uh, it's also a minefield to talk about. Yeah, you know, the whole you know German Jewish relations. It's always a, a minefield, and, and, and it will never be very easy. How many more questions do you want to take? Uh, which, uh, let's say you know maybe one or two more. Yeah, yeah. over there. You had, you had uh, just answered my question uh, basically, which was what is your opinion of how well Germany is now, contemporary Germany is dealt with its past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Yeah, well, I mean, there, there, the, the question was how Germany has dealt with its past. And as I say, I mean, overall, I commend you know, the German educational system and a, a lot of efforts by many, many Germans to um, German politicians and so forth to deal with their past. But there have been, you know, there are slippages. There, there are times when things, uh, you, know, feel, you feel that there's still an attempt to belittle certain things or to deny certain things. Uh, and, of course, there's also, I, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, there's also just this psychological thing of, uh, and, you know, it, it is difficult, I think, if you are the son or grandson or granddaughter of someone who uh, served that regime in any way, what do you, you know, you are not responsible, you, you had no control of what your father or, or grandfather did. And I remember this came home to me particularly uh, dramatically when I interviewed the son of Hans Frank. Hans Frank, of course, was the governor general of Poland during the war. So he was a mass murderer, a horrible man. Uh, and he was sentenced and died in Nuremberg. And I interviewed his son, when I interviewed him about 10 years ago, was a German journalist and he, had, he was born in 1939, so he had vague memories of being in Krakow in, in, in the in Governor General's castle and realized that he was entertained by concentration camp prisoners. And he also, but he remembers also being taken to see his father at the last time in Nuremberg before he was hung. 
He was eight years old. At that point, he could understand a lot. And he said, I always resented the fact that my father acted as, everything, as if everything were normal and never said, learn from my mistakes or do something like that. And uh, he said, I'm a typical liberal uh, European. I don't believe in the death penalty. But in one, one case, it was merited, my dad's. And you know, you hear that and you say, my father happened to be fighting on the other side in the Polish army in 39. Uh, and you know, neither of us, I can't, can't feel superior to him because my father was on that side and his father was doing what he was doing. Neither of us had anything to do with that. The, about Hitler's children. children. Yeah. I think, I think he's in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and oh, yeah. And so is uh, the American Women's Movement uh, uh, part of the Communist Party? I, I, I only, uh, the question was whether the Bund Movement here and sort of the Father Coughlin and all that mm -hmm. figure in my story, not in any big way. I really located my focus on the Americans there. You know, it's only as if, if they make uh, comments. That's a great, great topic. It's a great topic for, for a separate book, perhaps. But I just felt, you know, this is one of these topics where you feel fine, you've got to find your lens and, and go with it.